Join us for a look at the new My Little Pony deck building game from Renegade Game Studios, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this pony-themed game. My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game was designed by the in-house design team at Renegade Game Studios and with development by Christopher Chung. It features actual artwork from Mary Bellamy, who is the head illustrator for My Little Pony at IDW Publishing. The core game box, which we are reviewing here, was released in late 2022, and there have been multiple expansions released since. The base game box has an MSRP of $45. This cooperative deck building card game plays one to four players, is for ages 14 plus, and has a playtime of about an hour once you get the rules down. Now in this My Little Pony card game, players take on the role of one of the main six, the heroes of everything My Little Pony. Comprised, of course, of Fluttershy, Applejack, Rarity, Twilight Struggle, Rainbow Dash, and Pinkie Pie. The Guardians of Friendship work together to overcome a number of hurdles and then attempt to triumph over a final challenge. This is all done through deck building, managing the resources of help, info, and move, and collecting and spending knowledge, work, and friendship in the form of sugar cubes. For a look at these sparkly plastic cubes and the other components you get with this pony-themed deck builder, check out the My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game unboxing video on YouTube. There you'll see the very clear and concise rulebook filled with lots of My Little Pony artwork and gameplay tips from the main six. A punch board with various tokens and standees for the characters, a very purple box insert with plenty of room for the game components, as well as lots of room for future expansions, sugar cubes in two sizes and three different colors, bases for the character standees, and of course, cards. Standard size cards include starting decks for four players, character-specific card for each of the characters, Ponyville location cards, and situation cards used to make the game more difficult. There is also a set of oversized cards, one for each character featuring their unique ability, four final chapter cards, and 14 hurdles. Overall, component quality here is excellent. Uh, the only thing missing to me was a list of what to put where to best use that insert. But we did come up with a system that works for us. Now, I do recommend putting the standees in their bases once and leaving them there, as it is a tight fit, and you don't want to damage them by taking them in and out each game. So, what do you do with all this stuff? Let's move to an overview of play. So, the players win a game of Adventures in Equestria by overcoming three hurdles and then completing one final challenge before time runs out. They lose if the final challenge reaches its cloud limit, or you can't fill the adventure row, the card market, at the start of a turn. Get started with each player picking a pony and grabbing the matching big character card, their unique character card, and a set of nine starting cards, including five helpful ponies that provide help, the main purchasing resource, mm -hmm. two a good clean race cards that provide move, and one what you need is organization, which provides info, as well as one working together card that provides to help. Shuffle and draw five cards. As this is a cooperative game, you are welcome to play open-handed with everyone's cards just laid out on the table. If you find this leads to too much quarterbacking, you're also welcome to keep them in hand. Now the adventure deck is shuffled and six cards are laid out forming the initial adventure rope. Then players have the option of adding situation cards to the deck. This box comes with two copies of four different situations. Now, a standard game, standard difficulty, has you adding one of each to the adventure deck before the game begins. Note, you've already laid out the initial market, so none will ever start standing out there. Now, the rules suggest keeping this out your first couple of games, but I don't really see that as necessary. Next up, you set up the hurdles and final challenge. Sort the hurdles by level and build a face-down deck with one card of each level. Flip the top card over, and this will be the first hurdle you will have to face. Then randomly select a final challenge and place that face up as well. This deck can also be modified to increase or decrease the length and difficulty of the game. The standard game features one hurdle at, of each level, one through three. You could make things easier by using three level one hurdles or more difficult by adding a second level two hurdle, etc. Next, you set up Ponyville by placing the town square card in the center of the table. You then shuffle the location deck and deal one card above and to the left and right of Town Square. These are the locations your ponies can visit during play, and everyone starts at Town Square by placing their standee there. At this point, you're ready to play. Choose a starting pony, however you'd like, 
to take the first turn. Play then continues until you all win or you all lose together. At the start of each turn, you refill the adventure row so that it has six cards, sliding any existing cards to the right and knocking one card off the end if the market is already full to help refresh it. If all the tasks at a location are completed, that location is removed from the game. Any ponies there are moved back to town square and a new location is drawn. Finally, if there is no active hurdle due to one being completed in the last player's turn, you're going to flip up the next one. If all the hurdles are revealed, you just move on to the final challenge. Once all this start of turn stuff is done, you then get to take any number of actions using the main phase. There are a number of these, starting with... First off, play cards. Play cards from your hand to your play area. Most cards generate one or more resources which come in three types. Move, Info, and Help. Some rare cards also generate sugar cubes which represent knowledge, work, and friendship. Almost every card that isn't a starter card also provides some other benefit. As you would expect from any modern deck building game, these card abilities can do a ton of different things which aren't worth getting into in this review. Of note, due to this being a cooperative card game, there are many cards in My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria that, gives things, uh, that give things and help out the other players. Next action is buy cards. Use your resources generated by your cards just played to purchase cards from the market. Now, most cards cost help, but there are some that cost move or info. Any card purchased is placed immediately in your discard pile. Move to a location. By spending move points equal to the number shown on the top right of a movement card and move your standee onto that card. Various things are keyed to where your pony is located. Perform tasks. Each location lists tasks you can complete. There are three at each one. The tasks in Town Square are repeatable. It can be done by any number of times by any number of ponies. Tasks at the other locations can only be completed once each and once all tasks are completed, that location will be removed from the game and replaced by a new one at the next player's start of turn phase. Our town center tasks include swapping sugar cubes for different colored ones, using info to thin your deck, and collecting tokens. Tokens are something unique to this deck building game, as each token represents a plus two in one of the three main resources of move, help, and info. During a character's turn, they can spend any number of these tokens to gain a bonus in that resource. Great for making a big move, buying an expensive card, or completing an expensive task. Each plus two token can also be flipped and used as a plus one of any resource as well. Now, tasks at other locations always include three different things. There's always a low-cost task that costs a small amount of basic resources and gives you something good for it, like a token or a sugar cube. There's a middle task that usually involves swapping something for something else. So you kind of end up on an even field, but you get a different version. And then finally, a very expensive final task. This is going to cost you help and lots of it, but will also give you lots of sugar cubes. The average being eight help for three cubes. Now, this final task, though, can be made cheaper by having certain card types in your hand when going to complete it. For example, one task requires eight help, but costs two less for every pet you have in your hand. The next option is to use your character's ability. Every pony has a unique power that usually gives something to the other characters. For example, Rainbow Dash can give everyone move tokens, and Pinkie Pie lets other characters draw cards. That is as long as they are with her and sing or hum a song. <laughs> Once character ability is used, the card is flipped. It can be flipped back on a player's turn by spending one each of the main resources, info, move, and help, in addition, some cards, like pets, can flip these cards back over without that cost. Next option is to resolve a situation. Situations are bad things that come up in the adventure row, that is, if you are using them in your game. Each of these costs a significant amount of help to resolve. When doing this action, you can get the help of other ponies who can spend any tokens they've collected to help resolve the situation. If situations are left unresolved, they have negative effects, which always include adding more clouds to hurdles. More about that in a bit. Overcome a hurdle, or the final challenge. If your team has collected the required sugar cubes to complete a hurdle or challenge, any player on their team can initiate that attempt. First, you verify that you do indeed have the requirements listed, 
And then you flip up a card from the unused hurdles deck, and add the chaos text at the bottom of that card as a new requirement. These include additional costs like more resources, additional cubes, etc. to complete the hurdle. When trying to overcome a hurdle or challenge, other players can contribute to any required costs. These include sugar cubes, of course, but they also can spend tokens as well as cards from their hands to generate any needed resources. If you can pay this additional cost along with the initial cost, you complete the hurdle. All costs are paid, and players get the reward shown on the hurdle, and it is discarded. Final challenges work the same, except that you flip two additional unused hurdle cards and add two levels of chaos. If your group succeeds at paying that cost, the reward is that you win the game. If you fail at overcoming a hurdle or final challenge, there isn't very much of a cost. Everyone gets to keep their cards, tokens, and cubes, but the active player's main phase ends immediately. Now we move on to the end phase of each turn. Here, one cloud is added to the active hurdle. If it's already reached its cloud limit, that cloud instead is added to the final challenge. If that hits its cloud limit, the game is over and you lose. As hurdles in the final challenge accumulate clouds, bad things can start to happen. Now, these bad things are called cloud cover and are triggered when the cards hit a set card amount. Bad things also happen when hurdles hit their cloud limit. These bad things include all kinds of things like removing a certain card from the market, cards costing more from then on, movement costs being increased, players having to discard cards, and more. Finally, the active player discards all cards they played this turn and anything left in their hand, and draws a new hand of five cards. Assuming you haven't won or lost at this point, the game continues with the next pony. Remember, this is a deck-building card game, and the many of the cards in the game are going to break these rules in some way. The real meat of any game like this comes from the card interactions and what the players do with them. What isn't initially clear from these rules, and probably not even from this description, is the actual general flow of play in My Little Pony, the deck building game. In general, players will be trying to collect cards and complete tasks to get sugar cubes based on the face-up hurdle in play. Every hurdle and the final challenge is completed by having sets of sugar cubes in specific colors, and the game is really about collecting those cubes. Well, yes, you'll be spending resources to buy new cards. You're going to build your deck, and you're even going to try to thin it to make it more efficient. All of this is actually being done in order to get the cubes you need to overcome the active challenges. Now, another aspect of this is making sure that your group as a whole has some spare resources to deal with those random chaos texts that do affect you that you have to overcome along with the cubes. This is not a game about buying cards to buy better cards that let you buy ever better cards. But eventually it lets you earn points, as most other deck builders are. This is about collecting sugar cubes. Mm -hmm. Now, thankfully, when I signed the online form requesting a review copy of My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria, the deck building game, I had a good idea of what I was in for thanks to a fan of our show and Tabletop Bellhop Discord member, Sarah. Due to her, I had heard that this was a rather heavy, somewhat complicated deck building game before reading the rules and sitting down to play. What I didn't realize is just how nuanced this game really was. This is a variable market deck builder that features a total of six different resources to manage and also includes board game elements and unique character abilities. While this isn't quite the board game deck building game mashup of Lost Ruins or Arnak or uh, the Dune Imperium game, this game does have a lot going on and a lot that players have to pay attention to at once. The fact that there are six resources to manage is notable. I don't have any deck builders that are that complex. Most, in fact, have two or three resources, not six. Now, where this becomes a problem is that when people don't realize this and sit down to play, or more importantly, purchase the game expecting to play a kid's game. Now, I've seen this firsthand as the one time I brought My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria out to a public play event, I caught a small child, uh, probably preschooler, walking around hugging my copy of the game. And I had to go over and kind of ask for it back. And then I had to patiently explain to their rather frustrated parents that this is not a kid's game. And basically I had to explain to them that, like, yes, I could sit you down and teach you how to play. But there is no way that your daughter is going to be able to grasp this game. Maybe you'll be able to sit and play it. 
with them, like on your lap, maybe have them help make some decisions, but there's no way they're going to be able to grasp this. And it didn't help that these parents were also not hobby board gamers, but were rather expecting to find games like Monopoly at this event. And I had to explain to them that this may be too complicated for you to understand as well. And just seeing the look of disappointment, not just on the little girl's face, but even the parents face made me like I felt bad. I'm like, to this point, I have not brought this game back out to another public play event. And the fact is that the girl would have indeed loved the art. But the parents might well have been baffled as to how to play, let alone how to explain the game to the child. At best, the parents would have played the game and their child would have been brought along for the ride, contributing little, if anything. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, though, for hobby board gamers like me, and probably most of you listening to this, all this complexity is a good thing. This My Little Pony deck building game is a full on medium weight card game with solid mechanics including some new things I've never seen in a deck builder before. Now, one of those new things that I really like is this token system. This lets you use cards and spend resources to get plus two tokens that carry over for other turns. I've never seen a deck builder that lets you build up resources turn over turn like this. And I also like the way these tie into the cooperative mechanics of the games and the way you can spend them on other players' turns to overcome situations and to complete hurdles and the final challenge. I enjoy co-op deck builders, and I've played quite a few, and this one really does stand out for a number of reasons. Sadly, not all positive. Mm. But really, there is a significant amount of thought, planning, and cooperation required for a game about cartoons ponies that, as a cartoon, is generally aimed at a younger audience. Yeah. Now, the cooperation of the game is also enhanced by the number of cards in the game and the character's special abilities. Now, one direct example of this I want to call out are the pet cards. This box includes each of the main six's pets as adventure cards that can be purchased. Now, each of these pets does provide a good amount of help. If I remember, it's three help, which is pretty good. But they also let their owners flip the character cards back over if flipped. And by owners, I mean like the, the pony who owns the pet, not necessarily the player who bought it. And that's the neat part here is that the ponies don't have to collect their own pets. They're actually better cards for another player to have so that when they come up, they flip over your ability so that it's ready to use on your turn. This is unfortunately another mark against it as a kid's game, as the kids are going to generally want to match up the right pet with Mm. the right pony. Daddy, you're doing it wrong, (laughs) which isn't (laughs) ideal from the gameplay perspective, as Mo just uh, laid out in his example. Also, I do need to point out to non My Little Pony fans that when we say main six, that main, that's main Mm M-A-N-E, not M-A-I-N, despite speaking about the six key characters in the game. And I really can't explain how much this bothers me reading it out throughout this review. (laughs) I could have added in more because it's always every pony and uh, the the number of, of horse puns in the show is is quite high. I, I avoided most of them, but I did stick with the main six, as that is what they're called by fans and the creators. Now, another thing I like in this game that sets it apart from many other deck builders is the fact the market loses a card if no one buys anything from it that turn. One of the big problems that come up in deck building games in general is that when the market fills up with unwanted cards, either cards no one wants or cards no one can afford. This can cause games to grind to a halt where no one accomplishes anything. And you won't see that problem here because every round, at least one new card is going to be added to that market. Most turns more than one. Added to this, not only with just the rule that if no one buys anything, it empties out. There are a number of card effects, uh, often on the hurdles and final challenge, that remove certain types of cards from the market, making it refresh even quicker. So many deck builders have had to later add solutions to clear the market. And in this, we've got a built-in solution that the game actually takes advantage of with some cards having effects that trigger Mm -hmm. if they fall off the end of the market this way. Yeah, that was another neat one. Now, another aspect to set this game apart is scalability. Adventures in Equestria offers multiple ways to either make the game easier or more difficult, which is a very cool thing to me. Now, this comes in the form of the situation cards you can include and how many you include as well as how you build the hurdle deck before you play. 
While this is a reasonably common thing nowadays, it's well done and quite flexible, allowing a wide range of difficulties. Now, one thing that did stick out to my kids that they loved is that all the locations, hurdles, and final challenges are right from the first three seasons of the TV show. Now, they are bigger Pony fans than I am, but it's good to see that they stuck with existing lore. Now, Gwen, my oldest, also wanted to make sure I pointed out that this lore is just from the TV show and not the comics, but she was a little bit disappointed. I will say, to me, it looks like a My Little Pony game through and through, which made sense once I started doing research for this article and found out that the, uh, for this, this podcast and found out who the artist is from the game, who is the artist for My Little Pony, which is interesting to learn that this is actually all new, unique art, as opposed to using screenshots from the cartoon. With the expansions, of which there are three already, there's a lot of room for the game to grow and include other content. Yeah, Gwen wants me to pick them up just to find out if there are any of the comic book stories actually in there, which, um, for all the reasons to buy a board game expansion, that's a new one to me. Now, all of this official My Little Pony artwork from a My Little Pony artist does come at a cost, though, and that's gameplay clarity, the actual use in play. While the artwork is great, the iconography and clarity of those icons is not. Actually, it's kind of terrible. You'll see this right away the first time you play with the starting deck that everyone has, that a good, clean race card that everyone has two of. I have had multiple people I've taught the game have to hand me that card going, what's this card do? Because they totally feel to see the arrow-like plus one move icon on the side of the card. And resource generation icons being lost in artwork isn't just a problem on the starter cards either. Happens throughout the adventure deck. Now, I do want to say that it is fantastic that they kept the icons for the different resources in the same spot on the card mm -hmm. and every card so that you know that anything in a specific position refers to that specific resource. Mm -hmm. But they did that before they saw the final art, which on the starter card is problematic right outside the gate. Yeah. Oh, it would have took a white border or something, a fade, I don't know. Now that's bad, but even worse to me though is the text and icon size on the location cards. This text is so small, even my kids with great vision can't read them from across the table. To make things worse, many of these include even smaller icons, even smaller than the text. In particular, there is a certain icon that's used multiple places in this game, which is the help cost, which is shown as a small number inside a horseshoe. Now, at the top right corner of the cards, where it's how much you spend to purchase, it's nice and big. But on the location cards, it is tiny. I found these hard to read even at arm's length. And these graphic design issues have literally made the game unplayable to my wife, who has some vision issues. Note some visual issues. It's not like Deanna is legally blind. To her, some of these location cards are fully unreadable. And, we, and when we say that, we mean unreadable when you get a magnifying glass with a light on it to try and make it out. Now, you can work out what it is they must be, but that's not the point. Yeah. This is the biggest problem I have with my Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game. Once you know it's not for kids. This is a problem big enough that even adults may not be able to enjoy or even be able to play the game, which is the same. Because it is a very solid game. I really hope this is something Renegade Game Studios has seen to be a problem and something they fix, either in a second printing or a second edition or something. It, it's not a tough fix. Two things are need to, needed to change. The art on one of the starter cards and the size of the location cards. They already have large cards in this game. There's no reason not to make these location cards a larger size to increase the font size. I understand that there are cost implications, but the game is unplayable by some people because of the choice to make them smaller. Now, my final complaint about this game is actually also from my kids. It's a minor one that didn't bother me whatsoever, but they were, they were upset about it. They want to know why you can't play all six ponies. The entire cartoon this game is based on is all about the core six characters and them working together to overcome whatever's put in their way. They found it very odd that a My Little Pony game wouldn't let you play all six at once. They are called the main six, after all. 
Now, personally, what I would have liked to have seen is something done like in Japan anime games is a uh, deck building game for Cowboy Bebop, Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, where maybe all the pony standees are in play. And there's cards that let you move them like you can use your movement points to maybe move one of the non player standees and then some way to like use every character's ability, even if they're not controlled by a character player. To me, that would have just felt a little bit more fulfilling. Yeah, now I haven't played this enough, but I assume in its current configuration that six ponies would make the game unbalanced and too easy. But that's something that could have been resolved. I do wonder, given the age on the box at 14 plus, if they didn't have a wealth of people who grew up as pony fans, or if they didn't have a wealth of people who grew up as pony fans playtesting this. Even then, the game doesn't come with enough decks. Like, there's just not enough cards. So game balance, I think it'd be fine. Because this is one of those cooperative games where you do something, then something bad happens. Usually those aren't affected by player count at all. That's why the game works one player just as well as it works four, it's just longer with four. Well, the, the problem is uh, resources, right? With six people collecting resources, you would have that many more resources available for the challenges. And that, yeah, that balance would be, could be an issue. Possibly, but even then, the, the goals are usually per player. And, and all of the hazard clouds are per pony. So I, I honestly don't think it's that. I just, I don't know why it's a four player game. I really don't. Overall, I was surprised and impressed by the My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game. It's a very solid and engaging cooperative deck building card game. One that's definitely not a kid's game and features plenty of depth and decision space to keep hobby gamers like us entertained. Not only is this a solid deck builder, but it's actually one of the better cooperative games I've ever played. Due to the card combinations and the way you can share resources during key moments, you really get the feeling that you are working together while playing Adventures in Equestria. I laughed and joked about the game before we cracked it, expecting something far lighter than we got, and was pleasantly surprised that this was a solid, challenging game for gamers and not throwaway trash to pander to pony lovers. Now, the big thing to watch here, though, of course, is the size of the card text and the iconography. It's small and sometimes obscured by the artwork. No matter what, you're going to have to pick up cards to read what they say. And if someone in your group has vision problems, you may need to skip this game altogether. Now, if this isn't a problem for you and you are a hobby gamer and a fan of My Little Pony, just pick this game up. You're going to love it. With its detailed gameplay and great theme integration, this is going to be a hit with your group. You're getting a solid game with some real strategy and cooperation required, though you might need to push your non-pony loving friends to play with you. Once you do, they'll enjoy it too. Now, if you're a deck building fan and have no feelings either way on My Little Pony, you should check this game out. Don't let the My Little Pony theme scare you away. This is a solid cooperative card game and not in any way a kid's game. Now, if you don't like deck building in general, I suggest trying to find a way to play this game because it fixes some of the most po popular, I guess popular complaints sounds weird, some of the biggest complaints I've heard about deck building games and why people don't like them. Now, one of these fixes is a variable market that refreshes itself, so you're never stuck with a roll of cards no one wants. And another is the ability to carry over resources between turns through the use of tokens. Honestly, deck building is such a broad mechanic. Hating it is just silly. Sure, there are some games that use it, which might not be to your taste, but there's simply too much in this category to dim dismiss it entirely. Now, for those that really dislike card games, deck building games, and or My Little Pony, I doubt this one will sway you, and I doubt you're still listening right now to this review because you probably don't care. Personally, I really enjoy this game, and I am itching for more. I've now played enough that I kind of feel like I grok everything that's there. I've kind of seen every card come up. I've we have set strategies for dealing with certain things, and I really want to see what the expansions add to the game and how they mix things up and keep it interesting. Well, that's it for our review of the My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game. A really solid deck builder we worry people will overlook due to the cartoon theme. Mm -hmm. Keep the conversation going. Join the Tabletop Bellhop Discord to discuss this review, deck building games in general, or even My Little Pony. You can find it at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. 